Hi, and welcome back to another episode of the Christian Minute Podcast. My name is Anne Markey, and I'm your host. And today, we're going to be talking about six strategies for teaching and modeling Christian values to your children. So if you don't know me, like I said, my name is Anne Markey. I've been married now for 16 years, and I have three children. My oldest is turning 14, and then my middle is 11, and my baby (laughs) is turning eight years old. My number one desire as a Christian mom is that all three of my kids will have a personal relationship with the Lord and have a desire to obey Him and follow Him for the rest of their lives. And sometimes when I think about that desire, it seems impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. But as a young mom, trying to think about how do I teach my children about God? How do I pass on my faith to these kids? Like, how does that actually happen? And I think in my mind, it was this big complicated thing because I would look at the resources, you know, for family devotions or family prayer time. And it just felt overwhelming that for sure with most of my children, when they were young, I didn't have a lot of space. I was just surviving, holding on. Um, And when I tried to think about adding anything else on, it just felt impossible. And I think the Lord gave me grace in that time, knowing that it was too much for me. But now, as an older mom, uh, as a more mature Christian, I've come to realize that, you know, teaching my children about faith doesn't have to be this complicated thing. But that small things that we do consistently and regularly can have a really huge impact on our kids' faith. So since I struggled with this so much, I figured that maybe some of you did as well. And I just want to share some of the things I've learned over the years and some of the strategies I think are really worth it that actually make a big impact at the end of the day, but don't have to be complicated. Now, if you listen to my previous session or podcast episode, I talked about how the number one way that we can share our faith with our children is to model it for them. And so for all these strategies, it's really breaking down that modeling aspect into different things that we can actually model because that's the number one thing. And so the first strategy is to pray. Now, I'm not just talking about praying for your children. I think that's really important. And you can dive deeper into that later on. But really modeling prayer for your children. So instead of telling your children, you know, pray every day, pray when you're sick, pray when you're feeling anxious, pray during this and that. Actually stopping in the moment and praying with your children. For example, my son is terrified of thunderstorms and one night around bedtime we were putting him to bed and he could hear the thunderstorm and he was really really scared and because it's the end of the day I don't have a lot of patience and it was really just tempting to be like stop worrying about it just go to sleep (laughs) but thankfully the Lord gave me a little bit more patience and instead I went into his room and I said hey hon like I understand you're feeling scared I used to be petrified of thunderstorms you know let's pray and ask God to give you peace and so we did we prayed together and I prayed that the Lord would give him peace that he would be able to fall asleep and that he would know that God was with him that he wasn't alone now a few minutes later I go back into his room because he needed something he's like hey God answered my prayer it's not thundering anymore Um, What he didn't know is that it was thundering still. He just couldn't hear it. And so in his mind, the Lord had answered his prayer and it was a really tangible moment for him. So I wasn't just telling him, when you are afraid, pray. I was doing it with him. And so a really simple thing that we can do with our children is when they're trying to make decisions, when they're feeling anxious, when they're feeling scared, when they're thankful, when good things are happening, when every single one of these things, 
you know, maybe taking a minute and instead of going with our initial thought as to how we're going to react, we can lead our children in prayer. And I give my children the option. I'll say, do you want to pray? And something, sometimes they say yes. And sometimes, most often, they say no. And so I pray for them. There have also been some instances where I've asked my children if they wanted to pray and their answer was, I don't know what to say. So that moment is a teachable moment. We don't want to skip over this part because if they want to learn how to pray, we can tell them something really simple. And so what I say to my children is you can tell God exactly what you just told me. So before we get to the point where I say, hey, do you want to pray about it? My kids have usually told me I'm scared because this, that, and the other thing. I'm feeling anxious about this, that, and something else. Or sometimes they don't even know what they're feeling anxious about. They don't know how to put it into words. So they've already told me how they're feeling or what's going on in their mind, just like a one-to-one conversation. And so then when I say, hey, do you want to pray about this? And they ask, I don't know what to say, and I say, you just tell God exactly what I just told you. That's really easy for them because it teaches them that prayer is a conversation with God, that we want to build their relationship with God. Because I've met way too many Christians who are intimidated by prayer because they feel like they're going to say the wrong thing and that it's not going to work and that there must be some sort of magic formula. And the truth is that we want our children to know that God wants a personal relationship with us. So that means that when we come to him in prayer, it's like a conversation. So anything that we would say to a friend, anything that we would say to a spouse, anything really that we think, we can have those same thoughts and conversations in the presence of God. And so when I realized that, it made prayer less intimidating and I want my children to know that. So I just tell them, just tell God what you just told me. Or if they're still not sure, I want to make it really simple because my youngest is just seven. He's turning eight. So when they were a lot younger, I didn't want them to think that prayer had to be complicated. I wanted to give them really simple things that they could pray for. So I could, I would just say, well, tell God that you're scared and ask him to help you not be scared, right? And so then they would say, Jesus, help me not be scared. And that was it. But you're building this relationship with them because I think of, you know, a set of Legos that it's one block and then another block and you're building up on that. So when they're young, they really don't need to say more than a couple words, but what they're doing is building this habit of turning to God in these instances so that later on when they're older, maybe the prayers get longer, maybe they get more personal, but they're just continuing this habit of turning to the Lord. My husband hates it when I use the word habit because he wants to say, well, I don't want to just pray because it's habit. And my answer is, well, it's not a bad habit because we know that when something is a habit, it's easier to do. So if you want to have that relationship with the Lord, if you want to be praying with him, then really ultimately it's building up that habit so that it just comes naturally. If you want to know more about the power that prayer has when you're praying as a family, you can listen to a previous podcast episode I had about this, and I'll make sure to link that episode in the show notes so you can go ahead and listen to that. The second strategy is to read the Bible together. Now, one of the conversations I have with my husband a lot is anytime a Christian asks about how to get to know God, how to grow as a Christian, the answer is, read your Bible, and pray every day. And there's an entire Sunday school song about it, and it feels really simple. Like, that can't be it. That seems way too simple. It can't work. Like, this is not the answer. But as I've been a Christian almost my entire life, and the truth is, The more I get to know God, the more I grow in my faith, the more I realize 
That is the simple truth of the gospel. That to know God and to grow in our relationship with him, it only takes two things. And that is prayer, which we just talked about, and two, reading his word. And so instead of just saying to our children, well, hey, you want to know God, go ahead and read the Bible. As when they're young, we want to read scripture with them so that again, we're building this habit of reading the scripture every day. We also want them to see that we read our Bibles semi-regularly. And this is something that I struggle with because there's that verse about in the New Testament, but like when you pray, pray silently. When you fast, make sure that nobody else sees it because you don't want to make it look like, oh, look how holy I am. I'm reading God's word. But on the flip side, I know that when you see somebody do something regularly, so my dad wakes up at like four or five in the morning and he spends two to three hours reading his Bible every single day. And I know that. And so when I have a question about scripture, I automatically go to my dad because I know that he reads it every day and that he really knows his word. So he's not doing it to be boastful. He's not doing it to like gain spiritual points. He's doing it because he loves it. And in so doing, he's setting an example for me, but he's also subconsciously telling me if I have questions, I can ask him because he knows God's word. And so when you're thinking about your own personal practices, you want to be encouraging your children to read scripture on their own. And I think that starts coming when they're teenagers. So my oldest right now is 14. And about a year and a half ago, she really started to make her relationship with God personal. She wanted to read scripture on her own. And so one day we're just talking about it. And I said, well, hey, do you want a Bible reading plan? And she's like, they have that? I can do that? And I said, yeah. And so I printed one off and I gave it to her. And once in a while, I'll ask her how she's doing and what she's reading and so on and so forth. But it's her own. So I can support my children in that when they're older, right? Just guiding them, giving them resources, showing them how to do it. But when they're younger, they might not necessarily have that desire. And so it's doing it with them. And in our next podcast episode, I'm going to give you some tips as to how you can start having these regular Bible reading times as a family, because I know that that's not necessarily easy. Um, And I I just want to share some things with you that I've learned and how to do it really simply and easily so it doesn't feel overwhelming. So make sure you stay tuned and wait for that episode. So there's two parts of reading scripture. And the first is, like I said, to be doing that with your children or helping them do that on their own, which is that family devotion aspect, which we'll cover more next week. But the second is really that personal relationship with the Lord, that you are having some regular time with the Lord. And this is important, not just for your own spiritual growth, but If you really have a desire for your children to get to know God, it's really important that you are also getting to know him so that you're learning what scripture says so that when your kids are making decisions or when you're trying to make decisions for your children, you have that biblical wisdom in your brain so that you can choose paths that are driving you towards Christ and not away. Reading scripture for yourself is really the most powerful thing you can do because you're going to get to know God. You're going to get to understand him. It's going to help you in the way you think. It's going to help you in the way you parent. It's going to help you in the decisions that you make. And so this is really something critical that I really encourage you to do regularly. Now, I'm very much a person who says, I don't want you to feel guilty if it's not something that you're doing every day, because I know how hard that is. And I know how the devil loves to just take hold of that guilt and make us feel so guilty that we just never open our Bible again. And that is not what God wants. 
He wants to speak to you. He's given you his words. He's given us his word in Bible form that we can read. And it's something he wants us to do. So even if we're just doing it once a week, once a month, whatever, what, however much we're doing it, he loves when he, we open his word. So he doesn't want us to feel guilty about not doing it. He is just trying to encourage us, say like, I have all these amazing things to tell you. And I've given you an, it in this book and I want you to read it. I was raised in the 80s and 90s before internet. And I just remember how excited I was anytime I got a letter in the mail. And the moment you know that that letter is for you, you know, you're ripping up the open the envelope and you're seeing who it's from and what they have to say and to see like, hopefully they sent, you know, a piece of gum. And I just think about that excitement I had as a child to open this letter from somebody who loved me and sent it to me. And this is the same sentiment. God loves us so much. He gave us this letter, 66 books in scripture for us to open. If we're not excited to read God's word, then we can go back to number one, which is prayer. Um, I forget what verse it is, but it's this verse that says, you know, I believe, but help my unbelief. It's this understanding that we have faith, but sometimes we lack faith, but we need to ask God for more faith. And so it's the same for our desire for scripture, that if you're having a hard time opening God's word on a regular basis, you can turn that into prayer and say, God, give me your desire to read scripture. Give me the desire to know you more. And he will give you that desire and he sends you his Holy Spirit to help you and encourage you and to actually do that. So I love that not only does God give us his word, but then he sends his helper to help us do the things that God has asked us to do. Strategy number four is to actually model Christian values. So if we tell our children that they shouldn't lie because lying is a sin, then we need to make sure that we're telling the truth. If we are telling our children not to scream and yell at people and treat people badly, then we need to make sure that we're not yelling and screaming and treating people badly. So when I'm feeling impatient, I'm snapping. If I'm feeling unloving, I'm not a kind mother and I'm never perfect and that's not my expectation, but it's even in that imperfection, realizing that you also need to become better. And so you're not just using these opportunities to share with your children and say, hey, like we should all be doing this, but then admitting your own fault and apologizing and say, hey, like, you know what? I got that one wrong and I also need to grow and to be more like Christ. And so, you know, reflecting God's character in our daily lives is really an amazing way to show our children what God values. If we really want our kids to be living as Christ did, then we need to be living it ourselves because when we don't, there's a disconnection and they just, they, it becomes more of a religion and a practice and not a relationship. So really, we really want to make sure that the values that we're instilling in our children, the things that we're telling our children that God wants them to be doing, we also need to be doing those in our lives. And like I said, it's not always going to be perfect, um, but being willing to admit that you are also a sinful person that needs the Lord's salvation, that you need the Lord and admitting that to your kids. I know that that's not a very popular sentiment. It's for sure not something that was ever taught when I was growing up, like adults never apologized for doing things wrong. But I really truly believe that was one of the reasons why I struggled with my faith so much because I would see these people preach on the stand and then act it out completely differently in their lives. If you say one thing and do another, it's gonna confuse your kids and they're not gonna take you seriously. And so the values that you instill in them, you really wanna make sure that you're practicing yourself. So for example, Mark 12, 31 says, love your neighbor as yourself. And there's a whole parable about the question about who's my neighbor. But with kids, it can be just as simple as the people who live beside you. So how are you treating your neighbor? How are you talking about your neighbor? 
how are you connecting with the people around you? And we're not great at this. When you live next to somebody, you're going to have interactions with them. So are those interactions good? And how are you treating them, right? Um, Ephesians 4.32 says, forgive each other just as God forgave you. And in parenting, I talked a little bit about this. You know, I encourage my children to ask for forgiveness when they do something wrong, but then I in turn ask for their forgiveness when I've wronged them. And it shows them that, you know, even adults need forgiveness, but it also shows them that they can forgive, I can forgive them, and then how do we move on from that relationship? How do we keep going after that? And so by modeling those things very practically in your relationships with your children, we'll give them just a small picture of God's forgiveness because God can forgive anything and everything. There is no sin that he won't forgive when we ask for forgiveness. And so giving that forgiveness to our children really gives them just a small glimpse of God's ability to forgive. The next strategy is to be actively participating in church. So what do I mean by this? I mean that there are many Christians that pick a church and just go in at the beginning of service and leave right away and that's their church experience. And for some people that really works, but certainly the New Testament and also the Old Testament, you see that Christians lived in community There are so many verses about community in the entire Bible that if the only thing you're trying to study is Christian community from Genesis to Exodus, that'd be an amazing study and there'd be a lot there. So there is something to Christian fellowship. There is something to being united together in Christ and that sometimes that happens on a Sunday morning, but it's probably not going to happen when you're sitting and listening to a sermon that it's going to happen during the coffee and tea time. That it's going to happen during, you know, volunteering through ministry that it's going to happen maybe in small groups and in these other areas that, you know, showing up just for one service, you might learn a lot. You might be convicted. It might help you grow, but I really truly believe that real Christian relationships with others and real fellowship with others comes when you are actively engaged in church. So that means showing up for services as often as you can. That means volunteering for, you know, whatever ministry that you can be involved with that you enjoy. But then it's also supporting our children in the activities that they can participate in. For so for example, we really think it's important that our children go to youth group. So we try to make it a priority that on those evenings we can drive our child to and from youth group so that they can go. And if other kids need a ride, we'll drive them. And sometimes we need to carpool with other people, but we feel that's really important. And now, you know, our oldest daughter, she loves youth group. She never wants to miss it. And so we know how important it is for teenagers and how they're influenced by their peers. And so we want those peers to be Christians. And so we make it a priority so that she can go and be with other Christian teens and be influenced by other Christians. And so we try to make that a priority. Okay, my next strategy is this, and that is to be involved in Christian service. So that means volunteering with the science school. Maybe it's helping out with the VBS. Maybe it's a greeter at the door. There are a million and one ways to be actively involved in church, in service, serving the Lord. The number one reason why I say that this is really important is because there has never been anything else where I have seen God's intervention more. So what do I mean when I say that? Is that when you are serving the Lord, stuff happens. So for example, I'm one of the people helping out with women's ministry and one of the evening events was at the church. And so we turn up at the church early. We're trying to make sure that things are working and we don't know where the light switch is. And so finally we find the light switch, but it's covered in a locked box and we don't know where the key is. And so we're standing there thinking like, oh my goodness, women are going to start showing up. We're in pitch black. What do we do? 
Um, and so I, you know, I just prayed. I was like, Lord, help us to find this key and we need the lights to come on. And so in that moment, it's this understanding that there's nothing that we can do. Nobody knows where this key is. You know, we, we've called two pastors to ask them, you know, where this key is. Finally, we get a hold of them. They tell us where it is. We get it unlocked. The lights come on. But it's that very obvious need for God to step in and to help in the circumstance. And there is no other activity that I've been part in that gives you the same insight. That when you serve the Lord, you see God come through in so many different ways. You see God in a completely different light on a regular basis because you know what? Serving is hard and things come up every single time and over and over and over and over again, God steps in and he provides every single summer. Camp directors are worried that camp may not work because there aren't enough volunteers. And every single summer, the Lord provides volunteers step up and camp happens. The Lord shows up in service. And that is why I highly encourage you to participate in service, to have your children participate with you in service when you can. I know that's hard. That's probably an entire three other podcast episodes. But you see God when you serve for him in ministry. Your children will see God when they serve him in ministry. So I encourage you to serve to encourage your children to serve, to, that they see that you want to serve God, that they experience God in ministry. Whatever combination, serving the Lord is a great way to model Christian values, but to, to share with them who God is and how he shows up so personally every single time. So a few other Christian values that you can be sharing with your children through modeling them is hospitality. So that means, you know, making your home open to people, inviting people over, bringing people meals. There are many ways to be hospitable. Scripture encourages us to be hospitable. So instead of just telling our children to be hospitable, we can show them by opening our home. Another value that God wants us to be is to be generous and to be giving. And so we can model that by being generous ourselves. Now, this one's a little bit tricky because we don't tell our children how much is in the bank account. They don't know how much we spend on things because we don't want that focus to be on money. We also don't want to be giving in a way that we're boasting to our children about giving. Trying to find ways to be generous so that you're teaching your children about generosity, but you're not doing it, that you're announcing it to the world. So one of the simple things that we do, and we don't necessarily do this every time, but what we try and do is um, when we're at the grocery store, we'll have the children pick one item that we could put in the food bank box. So for us, it's a really simple way of just sharing what we have with others. You know, our kids are, can participate in it because they take turns picking what they want to give. And then they love coming to the grocery store and then they love picking it out and say, hey, mom, like, what are we giving to the food bank this week? And they remember. And so we're giving as a family. And that's just a really simple way for us to, you know, not only just teach them about generosity, but giving them an opportunity to be generous as well. So there are many other Christian values that you can find in scripture. But really, ultimately, it comes down to model what you preach. If you are telling your children that the Lord wants us to be this, that, and the other thing, it's really important that you're not just telling them, but you are actively doing those in your life. And they don't necessarily have to be totally obvious. They don't even need to be super complicated, just really simple ways, things that you can do naturally, you know, bring up in conversation and to share with them. And when you do those things, and you bring your children alongside with you, you don't even need to even teach them about it because it's just, they see it. And so then when they're spending time in church and they're hearing about all these things, they have examples, personal examples, because they've seen it in action in your home or in your family. The important factor is 
and this is sometimes the tricky part, is that we don't want our children to feel like all these things are necessary to have a relationship with the Lord. We don't want them to feel like they have to do those things or God won't be happy with us because that's religion, that's not relationship. And so there is a fine balance between teaching our children what a relationship with the Lord looks like and making them feel like they have to do those things to have a relationship with God, which just isn't true. And that's sometimes a hard balance and I'm not completely convinced that we've figured it out. But ultimately is that we don't want to force them to have these things, to believe these things. We just want to guide them and to show them with how we're living, the things that we're doing, the things that we believe in, the things that we say, that they see that a relationship with God is worth it, that God is personal and he loves them and he wants a relationship with them um, and that it's truly, truly enjoyable because they see the, the joy of the Lord in the way that we live our lives. So there's a bunch of other things that you can be doing. And if you're interested, I did write a blog post with some of the other strategies that I've used. So you can click on the link below and to read that full blog post. And if you have other ways and strategies that you do to model and to teach your children about God, I'd love for you to include that in the comments so that we can learn from each other. If you're looking for some resources to help you guide your children and you and to build that Christian home. I am running a free bundle right now. It's called Building a Christ-Centered Home and it's full of resources to help you do all the things that we've talked about today and it's absolutely free. So if you're interested in that bundle, you can go to www.onedeterminedlife.com forward slash bundle and I'll leave the link in the description as well so that you can get on that today because it does close at the end of July, which is only a week away. So if you're interested, make sure you sign up now because it will be going away very soon. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I hope you've learned something. I hope you've been encouraged and make sure to tune in next week when I share about the importance of having family devotions and giving you some tips of how you actually can start that. So thank you again for joining me and I'll see you next week. Bye.